Morning, everybody. My name is Michael, and I'm the youth pastor here. I have the privilege of serving your kind of 6th through 12th grade. That's, that's where I like to hang out. And uh, my wife and I just love the opportunity that we get to invest in that next generation alongside some awesome leaders, some of them here today. Whoop, somebody? There you go, Danielle's there. Yeah, it's so much fun getting a chance to do that. I'm also excited today because I have the privilege of sharing from God's word with you. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 16. There's a lot of text, so buckle up. Uh, we're going to run right through this, and it's going to be so fun because what we're going to see is kind of this heart of mission and this heart of how these people who love God and, and followed after God, what happened from the fruit of that. And so before we get started, I've got um, a little fun story for you guys. So um, when I got married, I'm married, and I went on a honeymoon, as you do when you get married. And when I got back from our honeymoon, we had a surprise welcome home party. It was not from humans. And so we get, we get to our apartment, and we go inside, and everything was, you know, everything was cool. We go, and, and we get all set up. We're unpacking our things, and we're like, oh, this is so great. It's going to be like our honeymoon more, you know, just tomorrow. It's going to keep going on. And so we fall asleep, wake up the next day, and the moment our feet hit the floor, these little black specks started hopping all around. They were jumping on my feet. They jumped on my wife's feet, and she starts screaming, okay, just screaming bloody murder because these, these things were jumping all over us. And we're like, what is going on? What is happening? And we start freaking out. We go into other rooms in the house or in the apartment. There were more of these black jumping things, and we ran outside, and we just kind of held our breath for a second. And we're like, what just happened? <laughs> What was that? And it was apparently fleas, okay? So uh, it was a total bro den before we moved in there. And they had a dog, and, the, and the, the fleas had laid eggs in the carpet everywhere. And over the course of our honeymoon, we get back, and they were covering the floor, I mean, with black fleas everywhere. And me, being a, a young husband and being just, like, so biblical, I, I grabbed my wife's hands. I'm like, baby. It's our first trial. Isn't this awesome? And but I'm so grateful that I married her because she has a ton of grace on me. And she just kind of shook her head like, you idiot. <laughs> what are you talking about? And, and so we, we kind of laughed about it, cried a little too. And then we uh, went to a movie and got over it. So we ended up looking up all these other ways to kind of get rid of fleas, right? We looked up like, you know, these plates with dish soap, apparently. You can trap them. And we tried all these natural things, right, trying to be environmental. No, we gave up. We bought the flea bombs, and we blew up the house with the flea bombs, okay? We eventually got rid of them after, like, two solid weeks of vacuuming and throwing away vacuum bags and cleaning out the house. It was ridiculous. But we learned a lot through that. And as much as I was kind of joking when I said it, it was true. Like, that was an opportunity for us to grow closer together. It was a chance for us to be able to kind of bond and, and to see what God could do. And honestly, we kind of got to figure out how to, you know, navigate challenges together. And that is so important in relationships. It's so important in life. And I think what happens in life sometimes is when we come across challenges, they might be silly, like fleas infesting your house. You're, never, you're not going to forget that one, I promise. Or maybe it's more serious. Like maybe it's a diagnosis. Or maybe it's job loss. Or maybe there's some sort of marital conflict you're going through, or, or maybe there's some sort of broken relationship that you had to deal with over this holiday season. Whatever it is, when we come across challenges, there's different ways that we respond to them, right? And, and some, in some sense, there's this way of responding where we see the gospel beginning to move in it. And so we have this framework we talk about at Finish Grace. We call it desperate dependence, okay? We made t-shirts. You can buy them for five bucks out there. Just kidding. No, I'm serious. There's really t-shirts. Um, and so this is framework, okay? And this framework of desperate dependence means this. It's we are desperate and dependent on Jesus for our everything. We need him. We recognize our need for him and how apart from him, we can't save ourselves. We can't save anyone else. We need him for our every moment. And it's from our place of desperate dependence on God that when we face challenges in this life, that when we come across hardship, when we come across things that we don't have solid answers for sometimes, it's in those moments that we actually have an expectation that God is going to move. We, we have this eager expectation that God is going to do something with this thing that we're facing, whatever it may be. And you guys, we see that 
all throughout the book of Acts. It was a very common thing that they believed. It's something they practiced daily. And we're in Acts chapter 16, and what we've seen time and time again is the kingdom moving forward. Nothing was getting in the way of it. It kept continuing to move forward with the acts of the Holy Spirit and these apostles who were willing to step out in faith and share the gospel. And so our summary statement for this morning is long because the text is long. So we are in Acts 16, and it starts off with this. There's this direction from the Holy Spirit. Paul, Silas, Luke, they're on this way to this Macedonian city called Philippi. It's a Roman colony. It's kind of a big deal in their area. They were headed that way because God told them not to go where they wanted to go. So in their desperate dependence on him, they follow his leading and they head over to this land. Now, when they get there, the gospel explodes in this town, okay? It it flips it upside down. They don't know what to do with it. And so it results in the beating and the imprisonment of Paul and Silas, because of what God was doing there. And so they're ultimately freed in this miraculous earthquake. I could use a couple of those every once in a while. Those are pretty sweet. Um, But there's this miraculous earthquake leading to the salvation of their jailer and his whole household. Their desperate dependence on God. It, It is the way that they saw these lives being changed around them. They were watching the gospel radically infect this place that they were in. And our desperate dependence on God our willingness to trust him, to give our lives over to him, it invokes this eager expectation to see God move. So guys, that's where we're going this morning. Let me pray for us and we will jump into the text. God, we come before you just asking that you would move in our hearts and in our minds, that you would grow this sense of dependence upon you and that we would look to see you move in all these different ways that you so love to do. God, we know you love to blow our minds with your love and with your grace and in the way that you woo people to you. And so, God, I pray that that would be true for us this morning, that we would see you for who you really are. And everything that we've put up on the throne of our hearts this week, we'd recognize it for what it is and trust you as more beautiful and more believable than any of those things. We pray this in your son's name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's jump right into Acts 16. It says, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained there for some days. The author is giving us kind of some key points of where's he going? Where were they? Where are they headed? These are some towns that you can actually look up and kind of see their journey that they traced. They go to this town called Philippi, and this was a Roman colony, which meant it had some more perks than most towns would have probably had. It had some rule and some reign there from the Roman government, and so they get there to share the gospel. But what I want to highlight here really quick before we jump in is a little two-letter word on the screen called we. If you're kind of like me and you wrestle with doubts, you're kind of a skeptic and and you come to stuff sometimes and you're kind of wondering, okay, how do I trust this? How do I know this is true? This is one of those pieces of scripture that is so cool because what we see is the narrator is including himself in the story. He says, we went. The narrator's Luke and he says, we went there. So he's present during this time. Now, wouldn't it be suspicious if the entire book was written in first person plural? That'd be kind of weird. Oh, we went to the upper room, and then we saw the Spirit fell, and then, oh, we saw Peter preach the sermon, and then we saw Philip with the Sumerian eunuch. It's like, what is going on? It would be confusing. It would be kind of suspicious. But instead, what we see is a we text right here in Acts 16, where Luke is actually with them. What this does is it boosts our sense of historical credibility of a text like this. And so if you ever wrestle with that kind of stuff, there's loads of things in Scripture like this that point to ways that we can trust what God is saying in his word. This is one of them. And so Luke is with these guys, and and they're ready to share the gospel. They're in this town of Philippi, and so it's the Sabbath day, right? They're hanging out there for a bit. They go there on Saturday, and they go outside the gate by the riverside where it says they suppose there was a place of prayer. A place of prayer is kind of like a synagogue almost, except there may not have been a physical building There may not have been enough Jews there, right? It's a Roman colony in essentially Greece. And so they go out there to try and find the Jewish community, and they go there to preach the gospel. It says, we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. They're hanging out. They're plugging in their Beth Moore DVD. Like, they're ready to rock, okay? They're there, ready to learn about God. And then Paul and Silas and all these other guys show up, and they begin to preach the gospel. This is so cool. There's this woman who responds. Her name is Lydia. Now, Lydia is a really cool character in the book of Acts because she was likely a slave at one point. 
Her name is Lydia. It's actually a name of a region in that area, which means that she was probably a freed woman. At some point, she was a slave, and she probably became free. Not only that, but it says that she was a seller of purple goods. That's your Dolce & Gabbana. That's your, your Gucci wear, okay? She was selling the really high-end Patagonia stuff, okay? And she was making a lot of money doing it. She was good at it. And so she was this businesswoman who kind of had her stuff together. She had her own home, this huge house where she could host people in and have people over. And so she is sitting there as a worshiper of God. She's a God-fearer, which meant that she bought into this idea of Yahweh, the Jewish God, but she didn't understand who Jesus was yet. She may have been a moral person. She may have been a good person, but it still hadn't clicked yet for her the gospel and the reality of her desperate dependence on Jesus for her everything. And so it says that the Lord opened her heart. How cool is that? God acts. They go in, not sure what God's gonna do in Macedonia, and then God opens the heart of this woman to receive the gospel. She paid attention to what Paul said, and after she was baptized, her and her household as well, she urged us saying, look, if you've judged me faithful to the Lord, come stay at my house, please, and she prevailed upon us. Yeah, she's a high-level businesswoman, okay? She knows what she's doing. She's like, look, people, you're staying in this horrible little dingy hotel. You need to come stay with me, okay? I got a big house. There's lots of rooms. Your whole like, group of people can come over. She's, she's winning them over. And what we see here is really cool because we see this early response to Christian faith. And we see what happens. What does she do first? She's baptized, Right? She gets baptized. That's, we, we at Vintage Grace call it believer's baptism. It's basically a way of identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. She says, I'm all in, and I want everyone to know it. If that's a place where you're at, you can do that next weekend. We're doing baptisms next weekend. You can sign up on your Connect card if you're interested in that. What that means is, is it's a representation of an inward reality, this truth that we trust in Jesus and that we follow him. So she gets baptized. And then what does she do next? She shares it, right? She goes to her household and she says, you guys, you've got to hear what I just learned. Come see who this guy is who's talking about Jesus. Come be a part of this. So she begins sharing. I was at a, uh, a one-year-old birthday party yesterday. Those are so fun. Uh, maybe some of you are past that, that age, but it's basically like a bunch of adults get to hang out and eat some great food while babies run around on the floor. It's great. So we're, we're there, we're hanging out with this, our friends, and, and we're just, we're having a good time at this little baby party. And it came time to sing to the baby. Now, if you've ever been to a one-year-old birthday party, maybe you remember your kid's one-year-old birthday party. If you're a kid, you probably don't remember your one-year-old birthday party. But what they do is, you know, they sit the kid down and they begin to sing to her. So apparently, at some of these parties, the babies just start crying. They're so confused, like, why are all these people singing? And so we all get around. There's like 20, 30 people in this house. And all of a sudden, she, you know, she's, she knows what's happening. She's clapping. She's smiling. And then the singing starts. And she goes, <laughs> just this blank face. And like, this is so confusing. Why are these people singing? I think I like this. But it was such a cool moment because have you ever thought about how weird that is? Like we, we, make, we make, you know, Hudson here. We're like, we sit him down. We're like, all right, Hudson, we're going to sing to you. And it's normal for us after about 20 of those. But maybe it's still weird for you if you're a closet introvert like me. Um, and you're like, why are all these people singing? And for the first time, she, this little baby is seeing it with new eyes. She's experiencing it for the first time. And, and as I saw that, it was, it was kind of causing me to reflect on what that's like. You see, that's kind of the same thing that's happening here with Lydia. For the first time, her eyes are being opened. For the first time, she's really getting the gospel. And the way she's responding is a very natural way to respond. She starts sharing it with other people. She's like, hey, you've got to hear about this thing. You've got to know about this Jesus that I found. It's such a natural response. There's this guy, um, he's awesome, he usually comes to first service, recently come to faith, and I feel like every weekend I see a new guy with him. He's like always bringing one of his friends. He's like, you've got to come see this thing. You've got to come be a part of what God is doing. That's a natural response. And, and somewhere along the line, we kind of miss that sometimes as believers. If you've been walking with Jesus for a while, sometimes we forget about that early stage of excitement and who God is. And I think part of it is we forget about our desperate dependence on him. We forget how much we need him for our everything. And that doesn't lead us with eager expectation. It just kind of leaves us sitting there watching ministry happen when really every single one of us in here is on the team and we're a part of what God is doing. And so we see her sharing her faith. And then we see family form. This is so cool. She says, come to my house. Come over. Come spend time with us. Let's slow down and have a meal together. Such an intimate space that she's inviting them into. 
And they responded. They stayed over, and we see this family being built around the gospel. Their desperate dependence that actually led them into this place of Macedonia is what we see this like result of God moving from. Right? We see God move, and they have this expectation. Now, for the first century audience who's reading this for the first time, this isn't that surprising. You know why? Because the gospel's been moving. Right? The gospel's been going forward. I'm going to nerd out on you guys. Get ready. Okay. So uh, you guys know what X-Men is? Some of you? You heard of that? Okay. There's this uh, character. His name's the Juggernaut. All right? And he, if he runs, you can't slow him down. Okay? You can't stop him. If he runs, he just gets this momentum, and nothing can stop him until he decides to stop. The kingdom movement's like that. It's this juggernaut. It's blowing through Greece, and people are getting on board, and it's unstoppable. They see gospel win after gospel win after gospel win. And so they continue to see God move, and they continue acting in this act of desperate dependence to see what God does next. So they keep preaching the gospel, and the next day they go down to the place of prayer, and they're met by the slave girl. She's kind of the next character in our story. The slave girl was, number one, she's oppressed because she's a slave, but then secondly, she's also demon-possessed. So it says in the text that she had the spirit of divination, which is basically like she was possessed by a demon that helped her kind of predict things. And so what would happen is, is that her owners were using her to game the stock market. They're like, okay, Tesla's about to blow up. You should have invested like 10 years ago and look at where you'd be now. So they're, they're, they're leveraging her demon possession. They're leveraging this like place that she's in. They're having her like tell fortunes for other people to make even more money. Okay, so she's being totally taken advantage of and abused. And this girl starts to follow around Paul and the whole gang. And she's like, hey, these guys are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, at face value, that's like, cool, slave girl's on her team. No, she's not, okay? In the Roman audience, the most high God, they're thinking of Zeus. You know, the guy with the beard and the lightning bolt? That guy, okay? They're thinking of Zeus. They're thinking of, of some other form of a God. And then not only is she just saying, like, about this high God, she says, there's this way of salvation. It's actually not a definitive article in the original language. It's not the, it's a way of salvation. Here's what she's saying. These guys are just like everybody else who comes through here. They're just like everybody else who comes through Philippi, who tries to say something about their God. They're just like everyone else. Don't believe what they're saying. They're just servants of the most high telling you another way. Wouldn't that get annoying after like an hour? It went on for days. It says for many days she continued to do this. She followed them around and was saying, they're the servants of the most high God, until finally Paul loses his cool. <laughs> He's done. He's had enough. And he says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And the spirit comes out. This is a really good moment for her. Here's why. She's now free from demon possession. She's not oppressed by this demon anymore. Not only that, but now her, slaves, her slave owners can't just leverage her lowly state. This is a great moment for her. She's now freed from that. Now, we don't know if she comes to faith. We don't know if she becomes a disciple. But what we do know is she was freed from this demon possession. And that was a bad thing for her owners. Her owners were not happy about that. They saw that their hope of gain was gone. They can't gain the stock market anymore. So they seize Paul and Silas. Luke may have, like, escaped at this point. He's at another different place. Maybe he's watching it happen. We don't know. But Luke isn't taken. Paul and Silas are. And they drag these dudes over to the magistrates. Now, magistrates are kind of like low-level judges. And they were put there from the Romans to keep law and order. So these guys pull them up there and they say, hey, these guys are Jews. They're disturbing our city. And they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. You see, they're kind of manipulating the crowd a bit. They're going off of their, like, kind of anti-Semitic sentiments that were there. They were going off of their xenophobia and, and their whole, like, Roman pride, right? They're trying to leverage the crowd. You know what's missing from that? Oh, yeah, they just exercised our slave of a demon. They don't mention that. They're just mentioning these things to try to manipulate the crowd, and it works. The crowd joins in in attacking them, and the magistrates, they strip them of their clothes. So Paul and Silas are now stripped naked in front of everybody. It's shaming for them. And not only are they now shamed in front of everybody, now they're beaten by these probably four-foot-long sticks that were wound together. And this group of people start beating them with rods in front of everybody. And the crowd joins in. There's a massive mob that's now attacking Paul and Silas. And after they got the life beat out of them, they get thrown in prison. 
was they threw him into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put him in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. It seems like it's just getting worse and worse, right? They've been beaten. They've been falsely accused. They weren't even given a trial. Now they're thrown in jail. They're not just in jail. They're in the maximum security place of the jail. They're in the, inter, the inner prison, in the center of it. Like, we don't want these guys getting out. Clearly, there's, there's some sort of power behind them. They put their feet in stocks. And it could, call, it could probably kind of feel to them like they're losing. And I'd imagine they'd have some sense of desperate dependence, right? They're sitting there saying, God is all we have right now. We're in prison. We've been beaten. We know later they are actually probably bleeding at this point. They have open wounds. And now they're stuck in this non-ventilated small room with a bunch of other prisoners being stuck to the ground with these stocks. And yet what's so crazy to me is that they maintain their faith through that. I pray that none of us have to go through something like that. I can't even think of like a level of persecution I've experienced. That's anywhere near that. Like getting made fun of at school is nothing compared to being beaten with rods. And yet they maintain their faith in God. It says about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. They're looking for God to move. They have an eager expectation of, okay, God, you brought us here to Macedonia. You saved Lydia. And then you cast out the demon of the slave girl. So what are you gonna do next? They're looking for God to move. And he does. Check this out. All these prisoners are in the room. Late late at night, they'd usually put all the prisoners in one room in case one would escape. They're trying to make sure everybody's accounted for, right? So they're in this room, and these prisoners are listening to them. You never know who's listening. You never know who's watching your faith and who's watching your life. And these people are listening and watching, and suddenly there was this great earthquake. This is God moving. The earth begins to shake. It's actually kind of common in that region. There's a lot of earthquakes in the area of Philippi that we know of today. But God is using and orchestrating this timing to bring about an earthquake. It shakes open the doors, knocks off their chains, and they're free. It says immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now, there was a giant earthquake. So guess who woke up? The jailer. Right? So the jailer wakes up and he's like, oh, shoot. It's about to go down. All the maximum security prisoners just woke up inside the cell, and I'm just right here. And so he freaks out. He's not thinking clearly, and he thinks, I'm not just going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my head. And so he goes to kill himself with his own sword. He pulls out his sword, and he's he's about to kill himself. He's about to end it all. And here's what's so beautiful is Paul cries out with a loud voice and says, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. How cool is that? This is his time to escape. This is his time to run, and yet he doesn't. And not only does he not run, but he somehow convinced all the other prisoners not to run. We see the gospel being lived out in this moment. He's like extending this arm of peace to him. So he doesn't run. And the jailer kind of calms down. He calls his buddies together with the lights. They rush in. And then he falls down on the ground before Paul and Silas in fear and trembling. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Is that not the million-dollar question? (laughs) Now, I don't know if he was necessarily thinking theologically in this moment. Maybe he's not thinking, okay, what do I have to do to like get salvation and like trust in Jesus? He may not have been thinking that. I think he was just like, how do I save myself? What do I do? He's desperate. He's dependent. He's in that moment of need. And they saw that moment of need and saw that God was working this whole time and they shared the gospel with him. He said, look, you don't need to just get saved from like people who are breaking out of jail. You need saving for your entire life. So let me tell you who Jesus is. Say, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And so he responds. He's like, yes, I want it. I'm in. Tell me more. And so he takes him to his house the same hour. He brings him in there, and they begin to teach the word of the Lord to these people. They're telling them about the gospel, and his whole family begins to hear. And at that very moment, here's another thing that only the gospel can do. It says this, that he washed their wounds, their captor, became their caretaker. That's the gospel played out. When you take somebody whose job it is to keep someone in chains, who was probably a part of the people who were against them in the first place, and then you see him be someone who's now washing the wounds of the one who was abused, that's the gospel. That's the gospel lived out. We see that so clearly in this text where suddenly this change happens in this man's life. He's radically changed from the inside out and he begins to take care of these prisoners who he could have easily wanted to still punish. And then, not only did he wash them, but then he gets washed. So he gets baptized. 
He says, I'm all in, and I want everybody to know it. Baptize me. I'm about this. And so he gets baptized, he and his whole family. So everybody's getting it. We see it again, right? This idea of baptism, of sharing it with other people, and then we see a picture of family. They eat a meal together. Again, this captor is now eating a meal with these people who were once his prisoners. That's the power of the gospel at work. So he eats this meal with them, and then they rejoice along with their entire household that they have now believed in God. This is so cool. This is like an only God kind of story, right? But God was moving that whole time. The kingdom was moving forward. All they had to do was keep saying yes and keep, keep moving forward with God and staying desperate and dependent on him to see him move. And so it'd be kind of cool if the story ended here, right? Like, sweet, everybody got saved. This is great. They moved on to the next city. But there's a little bit more to the story. The next day, the magistrates send their goon squad or their police down to go get him. They say, hey, let those men go. Get them out of there. They shouldn't be there anymore. Get them out. We don't want anything to do with them. In fact, we think that earthquake had something to do with them. Please leave now. And so the jailer goes back to Paul. He's like, yeah, uh, you guys should probably get out of here. It's not going to be good. And Paul, I love Paul. He's got a little bit of feistiness to him. He's a little fiery. And he fires back with this. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They've beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and they've thrown us into prison and now they want to throw us out secretly? No, that's not going to happen. No, actually, they can come over here and apologize. They can take me out themselves. Woo, (laughs) Paul's a little ornery, right? He's ready to go. He says, no, what they did was not okay. Oh, and by the way, they broke their own law. I'm a Roman citizen. That meant that he deserved due process. That's an ancient idea in government, right? He, he deserved to have a trial, and yet they didn't give him a trial. And so these people freak out. They are not happy. They're afraid. They run back, and it says that they were afraid that they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized. What? These guys who just beat them are now apologizing to them for beating them. This is important for a number of reasons. But one among them is this idea that what Paul and Silas are doing is they're trying to set up the faith community that's there for success in the future. And could you imagine if they got beaten and thrown in jail and no one said anything about it and they moved on? What do you think would happen to that faith community that's still there? What would happen to Lydia? What would happen to the jailer? They're at risk, right? There there would be concern there. And so what they want to make sure happens is that the playing field is leveled, that the gospel has a degree of credibility even in this public sphere. And so they go back and say, no, you need to apologize because you violated these people. You violated us. And so they set this standard there. And now the church at Philippi has a fighting chance. And in fact, later when you read in the New Testament, there's this book called Philippians. It's written to the church in Philippi. And Paul says, I am so grateful for your faith. I'm inspired by your faith. I pray that you continue to love God and you grow in God. They're like the poster children for Christianity, okay? You read Philippians, that's what they are. Joy is in there like 40 times. And here's the idea. He was setting it up for them so that they could continue this work of God, that their dependence on him would bear more fruit. So we saw that all throughout this text, that they needed God. They recognized their deep need for him when they were in the prison, when they had no idea what God was even gonna do in Macedonia, when they encounter, encountered the demon-possessed girl, even when the earthquake happened and when they were in, all that stuff was all a fruit and product of them just being faithful and following after God. But God was the one who was moving in all of those situations. God opened Lydia's heart. It's the name of Jesus that cast out the demon. It was God who caused that earthquake to happen at the perfect time. He was moving that whole time. All they had to do was look for what God was doing and be a part of it. And I think that's something that's very simple that we can do today. I used to go on a lot of Mexico mission trips when uh, I just got out of college. I went down there like six times in 18 months. It was a lot. It was fast. Um, But what I loved about it is we did all this preparation. And we would sit there and like write support letters and we put a thermometer in like the, the like lobby and people would give money to send us to Mexico. We would like do all this training and learn how to not say dame sus ropas because that doesn't mean give me the jump ropes. You can Google that later. Um, and so we learned all this stuff. We prepared to go there. And then when we got there, it was like the moment we jumped off the plane, we were ready to go. Like we were looking for God to move because that thing was so prayed up and that thing had so much work put into it and so much training. And then we felt like we saw God move everywhere. We ended up helping this organization we were working with come up with a way to self-fund their entire ministry by selling iPad sleeves. It was 
the like strangest thing, but God just orchestrated this conversation that led to us being able to help them toward financial sustainability. But that was a work of God. All we had to do was say yes and be looking for it. But then here's the disconnect for me is I got home from that trip, stepped off the plane in SMF, and I wasn't looking for mission. There was no sense of preparation. I was just back to community college and folding t-shirts at American Eagle. I wasn't looking for God to move. And I think there's a fundamental issue there. And it's this, is that we don't look at like our everyday stuff of life as mission and as things that God wants to move. Because you may have never gone to Mexico, you may have never gone to India or Papua New Guinea or whatever, but I can tell you right now, if you're a believer and you're here today, you've been on a mission trip and you didn't even know it probably. You went to a Safeway. You went to a Starbucks. You went to your gym. You went to your kid's class. Everywhere that we go is an opportunity for God to use us for kingdom movement. My barista that I talked to about photography today, he has no idea that I'm praying for him to fall more in love with Jesus than he is with anything else in his life. But I'm praying that God uses those conversations and we can look at anything in our life as a way of doing that, as a way of sharing God's love. We saw them do it, but there wasn't a whole lot special about them beside the fact that they trusted in Jesus and they looked for him to move. And so I think the best thing that we could do with our time today is to just spend a little bit of time reflecting on the love that God has for us, of falling deeper in love with him, of growing in our desperate dependence on him because it's from that place that God moves. It's from that trust and need in him that we begin to look for him moving in all sorts of different ways. But if we don't start with our R1 relationship, our relationship with God the Father, we miss it. And it's so easy to get numb to things and it's so easy not to, not to be looking for God to move in these simple conversations. And yet he is and he will. But the best thing we can do is just fall more in love with Jesus to we recognize our need for him we recognize that apart from him, we cannot save ourselves and recognize that he wants us to join him with him in the redemption of all things. So I'd like to invite the ushers up and we're gonna sing this song where we talk about beholding the glory of Jesus. It's from that place that we see God move. So let's worship together.